My first awareness of Florine Stedheimer's frames was a little more than 30 years ago when I went to the Wadsworth Athenaeum, mostly to look at a lot of their Hudson River landscape painting and frames, and I saw this remarkable painting and frame. This is beauty contest that we were talking about earlier to the memory of P.T. Barnum. But I was enchanted by this frame that actually extended the composition that had this marvelous swagged curtains with gold tassels that really uh, underscored this pageantry that was taking place before us. But I really didn't know much about her. And then over the years, I was aware of that picture, and also I had seen New York Liberty on view at the Whitney once or twice. But it was actually last summer when the Jewish Museum had the show of Florine Stedheimer's works that I went and I was captivated by the broad range, not only of her art, but also of the frames on so many of her pictures. And in fact, when I started, when Lisa and I started talking about this as a subject for a talk, my idea for a title was Hidden in Plain Sight, because I was struck by the fact that so many people were now enjoying this renewed or, or new interest in Florine Stedheimer and her remarkable artistry, but no one was talking about the picture frames and what an important part they have in the story. And her life was really remarkable. This is a picture of Florine with her, other, with her two sisters, Carrie and Eddie, Henrietta. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the conversation, they led an incredibly cosmopolitan life, spent many of their formative years in Europe, primarily in Germany, but they were around for Vienna 1900, the Werner Werkstätte, they traveled to France, to Italy, the ballet, the ballet russes. They, it was just a remarkable upbringing. And then, of course, going back and forth between New York. And it was, in fact, New York city to, the, to which they returned because of World War I. They came back in 1914. And when they came back, they actually moved into the apartment of their Aunt Carolyn, and it's up on, just off of Columbus Avenue on 77th Street. And uh, actually, Eddie could not stand the environment, but they were there for a number of years and did not move down to Alwyn Court on 58th Street until about 1927, and then were in Alwyn Court from 27 until Rosetta's death in 1935. So actually, to answer your question, Mark, the salons that you're referring to originated first in this brownstone on 77th Street, and then continued when they moved to Alwyn Court. And it really is remarkable when you look at some of the people that were in the Stedheimer circle. These are artists, just, and this is a partial list. Duchamp, Gaston Lachaise and his wife, Picabia and his wife, Marston Hartley, Eli Nottleman, Charles Demuth, Georgia O'Keeffe, William and Marguerite Zorak, uh, Carl Springhorn, Edward Steichen, Maurice Stern, Alfred Stieglitz, Adolfo Best Mogard, also known as Vito Best, and we'll hear about him in a bit. Those are the artists. Then there were extraordinary other people that were involved in theater, writing, playwrights, Russian uh, ballet dancers, Leo and Gertrude Stein, musical composers, Virgil Thompson, Louis Boucher, who was a well-known gallerist at Wanamaker's. Um, Robert Locker, who I mentioned earlier, he was from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and was actually a childhood friend of Charles Demuth's. And they were very close friends when they were in, um, in New York City, and he became a really noted interior designer. I have to tell you, I learned how many of us have wondered, is it Demuth or Demuth? And I learned that Demuth himself cultivated that when he was home in Lancaster, it was Demuth. And when he was in New York, it was Dima. Go figure. I learned that from the director of the Dima Museum. But as we were talking about this, Lisa mentioned this book yesterday. I cannot recommend this book highly enough. This is by Stephen Watson, Strange Bedfellows, the First American Avant-Garde. And it covers 1900 to 1920 and talks about all the many publications, the poetry, theater, the birth of the uh, Greenwich Village, 
uh, the Provincetown players. Um, and he has, uh, in the back, he has a cast of characters with little short bios who all these people are and their intersections. He has, uh, I've covered up the Ahrensburg half, but he has these marvelous charts that show a lot of the interconnections between the Stedheimers and the Ahrensburgs, and there were absolutely overlaps, no question about it. But we're here, I'm here today to tell you about frames. So as I looked and started to um, explore the many different frames of Florines, as is so often the case, period photographs are such a resource and a treasure trove of information. And these were photographs taken, I believe these are photographs that Eddie had taken soon after Florine died in 1944. She had moved into the Bryant Park studio. She had a small studio, but she took this larger duplex studio and moved there full time in 35 after her mother died. And um, even this photograph, this is not such a hidden photograph if you start reading about Stedheimer and looking. Uh, there was a marvelous um, exhibition in Germany about Stedheimer, and so these these exist and here you can see just in this photograph in her studio where you see several different frames that are really kind of fascinating. So I determined that there are two different kinds of what I would call ready-made frames or what we call length molding in the business. The first is a simple half round usually finished in silver often aluminum leaf and then a plain OG uh, length molding that was finished in many different ways. And then there are different custom frames. There were unique frames, what I've named curly Q frames, the ray pattern or fluted <coughs> frames, lace variations, and scalloped frames. So the simple ready-made frames are of two types. This is a half round, a very simple silver frame. This is original frame on the portrait of Eddie. And you, uh, as you look, at Florine's artworks, many of the artworks are in these simple round frames. This is a photograph of Alwyn Court, where they lived, and you can see, for example, two portraits there on the right, as well as the portrait we were just looking at, that all have this simple half round. This is, would have been an easy utilitarian molding for her to use. Interesting to me that she's choosing a silver finish. You think about it, this was the time, we're talking about the late teens and the 20s, where silver as a finish was very popular in the modern world. It was really considered a very modern surface. It was an homage to machinery, to airplanes, to aluminum. So silver, uh, an interesting choice. This is one of the little jewels that was in the exhibition at the Jewish Museum. And one of the reasons I love it so is it has Florine's tinsel inside. She's, um, there are pictures where she's draped tinsel around her pictures. She loves all things sparkly. And I think it's such a, uh, a wonderful gift that in addition to this beautiful floral watercolor that we actually have some of the tinsel that Florine herself would have had included in the frame. Just the detail showing that. So I was, you wouldn't think you would get excited about tinsel, but I thought it was so exciting. And then there's this soft OG length molding. Um, this is actually the earliest frame I've been able to find that has what I would call uh, an artist painted surface. So here, this is in the collection of the Phoenix Art Museum. It's called, called an Easter picture. And it has been painted very purposefully in this sort of orangey red color and picking up uh, pictures from the canvas, and this dates to 1915 to 17. But there are many pictures. This is one example, Sunday afternoon in the country, and this is where the frame is finished with a sort of silvery gilded surface. Then there's Picnic at Bedford Hills, and it's the very same molding, but it's been finished in a gold surface and, and metal leaf. And it's interesting, too, from a, from a gilding standpoint, that a lot of her frames are finished in alternative leaves instead of gold leaf or silver leaf or white gold. It's often aluminum leaf or metal leaf. And uh, the metal leaf having a much more sort of coppery quality to it. And here's heat. 
Um, same thing, very same profile in a very sort of coppery surface color. And this, I could show you many more examples of this molding. Um, even Asbury Park, considered one of her greatest paintings, is in a very simple silver variant of this very molding. But the unique design frames are especially compelling. I always hear my father, I always find myself wanting to say, these are very unique. And my father would always say to me, it's either unique or it's not. <laughs> so, so I have to tell you, I'm resisting the urge to say how very unique these frames are. But other than the red painted molding on the Easter picture, New York Liberty is the first really remarkable, unusual, one-of-a-kind frames that we see Stettheimer create. And it's interesting because it's really a very simple twist molding, probably something that you could get in a hardware store. I'll show you details. And it's, it's rather um, naively affixed to a very simple surround. So it's just this simple twist molding and then it's made personal by this wonderful uh, gold tassel and then also adding the, the eagle, of course, at the top. And then as uh, we were talking about, this incredible surface that she would build up in certain areas of her pictures. And it was more often than not was areas that she gilded. And uh, I, I think this is interesting because to me it underscores the way in which, in, in, for her, the frame and the painting were really not separate. They were really all part of an integral whole. And then, of course, the Marcel Duchamp frame. This has gotten so much, uh, gets so much buzz for so many good reasons. Um, and it's so interesting because when you find this illustrated, uh, it's whether someone is bothered to, to mask out where it's just the frame or where you see this marvelous shadow that gets created. So you have this amplification. You get all of these letters uh, doing double duty where you have the the cutouts and then the shadows. Well, this actually came up for sale at Christie's last November, and Liz Beeman was really lovely. She allowed me to come and examine the frame. This is something that we so seldom have an opportunity to do for um, artworks or to even be able to take something off the wall and see the back. And one of the questions I'd love to answer is who made these frames for Florine? I'm certain that she did not make them. Um, but this frame is remarkably simple again. It's just a simple molding and then literally this is just the letter M and the letter D cut out of plywood over and over and over again. So someone measured these out precisely and carefully cut them out, sawed them out, and then affixed them by nails all around the circumference of the frame. It's very interesting that there are areas of the frame where it looks like it was spray painted and even an area where it looks like it's possibly might have started out being white. And I don't know if the, the structure was white and the letters were always silver, but these are just painted. There's no gilding going on here at all. It's very much just silver paint and remarkable that it has survived pretty much intact. There are a few modest cracks in some of the letters, but for the most part, it, it, it's rather remarkable that this frame has survived. And then, of course, beauty contest. One of the wonderful discoveries uh, or, that I made was going up to the Rare Book and Manuscript Library, the Butler Library at Columbia University, where there are many drawings and sketches on deposit that Florine made that were clearly her working out a lot of ideas. There's also a scrapbook with clippings of uh, times where she loaned her painting to exhibitions to different places. But this idea of the folded curtain of gold tassels recurs over and over again in her work. And you can see that when you look at these drawings. And I love, she even would draw a frame and then carefully cut it out to try to visualize how was that going to work. I like that. I, 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 there's, I, there's the fringe, there are the tassels um, very clearly indicated. Um, 
Ulrich Birkmeyer, who's a conservator at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, who, who owns beauty contests, called my attention to something I had even overlooked, which is if you see in these, this period photograph, this is blown up from that early studio shot, there was actually a, an additional swag of some sort of festoon on the bottom section of the frame. It's long gone, no one knows what became of it, but I think that's a really interesting detail. And there was furniture that Florian designed. This is one that you can see, it's almost exactly the same as the frame on Beauty Contest, the, the vanity with the stool. And, and then above it I'd point out is the painting called Music. And um, it was referred to in something I read about it, a carving gilded frame. That's not a frame on this painting. This is gold beaded fringe and satin ribbon that Florian has tacked on that painting. That painting belongs to Brandeis University the Rose Art Gallery, and it has just a simple wooden strip molding. My hunch is that when that painting went to Brandeis, it didn't have a frame on it at all because it had resided in the studio with this beaded fringe wrap. And another example, there's a, a table, very same, if you would call a suite of furniture that's all these beautiful white swagged curtains and gold tassel and, of course, New York Liberty uh, hanging on the wall, the cellophane curtains. These are the stairs that would lead up to her lace bedroom, which we'll be looking at in a minute. And if you go through, if you look on to the right, that's looking into that front Studio, the studio at that very first image we saw of the studio with all the artworks um, in front of the fireplace. Sketches for the tables. Curly Q frames. I have to tell you, this is one of the most unique, <laughs> most unique designs I've ever seen in terms of frame design. This was a, a portrait. Um, that uh, a family friend, Louis Bernheimer, who was related to the Stedheimers by marriage. And on the right is a postcard that she sent to him where he was vacationing on the coast. And she's, he was well known for wanting to suntan and, and work his, his skin to this beautiful burnished bronze color. And she wrote to him and said, circle which one, put an X by the color that's most close to what color you are now. And, and he, you can see he X'd the two, and he said, we, one of these two is probably the most accurate. But this frame is so unusual. It is a, very much like that half round molding we saw, the, the silver length molding. But then it has these curly cues. And these seem to be, if I had to give a name to the material, I think it's probably rattan of, or wicker. It's that material. At first, when I saw it, it reminded me of that. Remember the old clothesline that was fabric, but it had the plastic coating? But this is much more rigid. So this is the half round, and then it's had this curly cue added to it. And it really just was made to, to fit in behind. So there were little holes drilled so that these curly cues would insert into the holes. And so it would allow them to create this. this uh, <coughs> curly Q design that went around. And we know from other Julie photos that there were other examples of this. We see um, Journey to the Sun from 1927. Uh, the first thing I'd call your attention to is that the, the profile, rather than being the half round, this is um, a very simple scoop profile. And that seems to be the profile that she used on all the curly Q frames after that. Then there's also this one, Birthday Bouquet from 1932. It's the same design, but do you see how much looser and larger the loops are? It's not nearly as tight and busy as earlier variations, but it's that same scoop molding. And then, of course, Family Portrait 2. It's the same frame. So it's interesting that that very first curly Q frame on the portrait was from 1922, and then we're all the way 11 years later in 33, and I think it's possible that over their period of time there was more than one person who was actually fabricating frames for fluorine. So this would just be a good example. And again, I, my hunch is that this frame has been repainted, but I do believe that all of them started out life either in a, a white or even a very pale gray color painted. No gilding and no metallic paints at all. And what I call lace variations. 
Uh, when I first started talking about fluorine uh, Stettheimer frames, people were like, oh, right, she made the lace frames. And then as I started looking, I realized that there isn't just a lace frame that Stettheimer made, that there were many different variations on lace. On the left is a painting in the collection of the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, a portrait of our nurse, Margaret Burgess. And on the right is the sun in the collection of the Whitney Museum. I was used to seeing the Whitney frame, but in all my many internet searches, I came across this portrait of Mar Margaret Burgess in this really unique uh, profile. And this is a good point to mention that fluorine was mad for lace, Nottingham lace. Many of the articles you read about her, everyone remarks on the fact that fluorine loved this Nottingham lace. And what's really uh, one of the interesting things to notice, this that is that bedroom, bedroom that when you could look up from there and you saw the, the, the rooms, the, wind, the sort of arched windows up above, this is the room you're looking into. And I'd call your attention to the, the corner cabinet and also the screen. Because you'll see there's this very pendulous style of lace cut out, as well as the bird baby head frame there on the wall and sure enough drawings that she made where she's clearly thinking through the designs she wants for these objects and again this notion of the indicated environment this is another view of her studio and you can see in the studio uh, another curly Q frame there on the left but I would call your attention to the two demi loon chests on either side of the bookshelves there and that pendulous lace decoration that skirts the bottom of those. And sure enough, there are many drawings of these demi loon chests also among her papers. And you can see very clearly here in this detail that the style of lace, if you will, on the sun is really a very different style of lace than is on the demi loon chest. I had an opportunity to go down to the Whitney and they were kind enough to let me examine the painting to take it out of the frame and look at it up close. One of the interesting um, aspects of the frame is the way the, the surface is incised. And this is a simple matte white paint. It's not, uh, not fancy it's or lustrous or even uh, enamel. It's almost like gesso. It has that sort of matte chalky quality. But you see this lovely incised motif. And sure enough, there in her papers, you can see where she's working out all these different designs of lace. And again, going so far as to trace the outline of the form she's interested in and um, cutting it out so she has a better sense of it. So a lot of times the construction of the frame can provide clues to us about who, who made the frame and or how they made it. Um, heaven, oh, if there were such a thing as a label <laughs> that someone might have affixed or assigned uh, their name to the frame, and I have yet to find anything that um, what might indicate who made these frames. But the, the quality of the construction on all of them, and this is certainly one example, all has what I would call a rather naive quality. It's not necessarily approached in the way that I think a frame designer or a framer might make it. And it does beg the question, did Florine possibly engage a theatrical set designer or maker? She was well connected with many people involved in the theater. Lee Simonson is one person who comes to mind. So this is one avenue I'm interested to pursue to find out if we might be able to get more information. And then here's this, again, this very different style of lace on Margaret Burgess. Just have to find my place with my notes here because I have something I want to read to you. This actually was one of the most exciting discoveries, if you will, that I made as I was looking at all the different designs of lace and looking at Margaret Burgess. 
this is a Julie photo, and there's Margaret Burgess in a simple silver half round that we know was so popular. And sure enough, I'm reading Parker Tyler's 1965 book, and there's Margaret Burgess hanging in Alwyn Court in the simple half round. So even though Margaret Burgess has one date, it does make me wonder, when did she reframe Margaret Burgess? Was this something she designed several years later when she moved into Alwyn Court in the 30s? Perhaps she was designing and reframing things at that point in time. But this was a super exciting discovery. This says, I should like to have the effect of embroidery and the frame to slope incline toward the spectator. I hope you will improve it, especially the corners. I may not want the bamboo frame if this is becoming to the portrait. And there's 20 by 38. Margaret Burgess's portrait is 20 by 38. So here is this very exciting evidence that she was absolutely not making these frames herself. She was working with someone. Was it the person who was making her furniture? Possibly. But she's communicating what it was she wanted and giving them directions. And this is one I'd love to see. I don't know if this still exists. This painting is in private hands. It was sold last, I think, at Christie's in the 80s. But this is uh, among the Julie photos. It's dated 1929. And if you look at it, it's that same simple molding that she used on so many other pictures. But it looks to me like it is simply doilies, actual paper doilies that have been affixed to the frame surface and covered all the way around. So when someone said, oh, she made frames of lace doilies, at first I poo-pooed it and said, well, I've never, there are a lot of lace inspirations, but I don't think any doily frames. Well, I've been eating my words. Uh, I would love to, I'm, I'm pursuing some things to see if I might find out if this still exists. So very interesting use of lace doilies. And then ray frames. I've identified only two of them. And these are different sizes because the paintings are this different in size. On the left, <coughs> excuse me, is a portrait of Virgil Thompson. And on the right is the love light with pink candy heart that Jim was talking about. And these are both in what I think of as ray frames. You know, so much when you read about Florine and her work, you hear about how she was so enchanted with this notion of luminosity and light and the quality of light and this to me is sort of the effect that you get when you look at these frames. Um, strictly speaking from an architectural standpoint the, the molding could be called fluted because of the concurrent um, concavities all the way around but the way that they're put together and the fact that they're finished in this silver to me really ends the, uh, uh, underscores this the sense of light and, and rays emanating from the canvas. And then finally, the scalloped frames, or what uh, are the frames on the cathedral series. Um, I was aware of these for a long time, having seen them at the Met. Um, as, as I said, they're, they're all uh, four in this same design of frame. But what was interesting is I had heard many years ago that two or three of the frames were original and one of them had been replicated. And then I also heard, you know, that Cathedral of Art was unfinished at the time of her death, which I, I hear two things. It looks pretty finished to me, and it's dated at the Met 1942. Stettheimer died in 44. So unfinished, what does that mean? Were the other three paintings framed and Cathedral of Art was not framed? In the Parker Tyler book, there's a picture of Cathedral of Broadway, the very first Cathedral's picture, and it's in the simple length molding. So again, these are just more conundrums. But what's really fascinating is these are all different. There is not one of them that is exactly the same as the next. I was able to go to the Met. We took all four of the frames off the wall one by one and examined them. They are all slightly different in their width. At first glance, sure, they're all the same. I can tell you that all four of them are gilded with metal leaf. Only one of them, the Fifth Avenue frame, is gessoed, 
has a gesso surface. Uh, but if you look at the back, which we were able to do, you see that they were actually, there are several different ways. It's almost as if every single one of these frames was made by someone else. And it, it, one example would be on some of them, there's a little uh, inset, a little slide in the, in the lobe. Uh, here you can see where it looks like they used to drill and countersunk the hole from behind, where some of the other earlier ones have a very simple, uh, almost uh, hardly noticeable, very hand-carved uh, circular where, where the holes are on the front. Um, uh, many of them have been painted with bronze paint in the back. They all have the, this sort of scallop shape, and then they all have this simple wood piece that along with the, uh, with the front, actually, uh, that along with this sort of rounded portion here is what creates the rabbit. But when you look at them up close, you can see that the character of the carving is very different. You can see how different this really is from this one, the way this one is rendered. So again, it sort of begs the question, uh, I, I went through all the curatorial files and there's nothing in there at the Met uh, about which ones might have been framed. It is interesting, these are all the same size picture, they're all 50 by 40. It would not be unusual at all that over the years, one painting got taken out of one frame and put back into another frame. This happens more frequently than you can imagine. But this introduces one of my most exciting discoveries, and that's what I call the Billy Letter. I was really interested when I was reading Barbara Blumenk's book. When I read about an artist, the first thing I do is I go back to the index and I see if there's an entry for frames, or P for picture frames. And sure enough, she had two entries for frames, and she remarked in there, that, that Florine had designed frames. And she said that there was even uh, one uh, unfortunate example where someone, one of her framers had copied her designs. And she quotes parts of the letter. So I was really interested to see this letter. I went up to the Beinecke Library. It was just signed by someone named Billy. There was no last name. And I read the letter. And I came to an entirely different conclusion. I do not believe that this was one of her framers. I believe this was someone in her social circle. And I'll read you some excerpts from the letter. This was a two and a half page typewritten letter. And he's, he's like very, I'll, I'll read to you. Dear Florine, if I felt that I had abused your hospitality, as you say, by taking and exploiting your idea of frames, I would most certainly not have been as eager as I was to see you today. Since I framed my first show eight years ago, I have been interested in frames and designed them. During that time, Cavassier and I have often discussed making a complete line of modern moldings. When I returned to San Francisco a year ago last spring, after my first New York visit, he suggested that, since I was now concentrating on design, I work in his shop and produce some models. The following summer, I did so. About 15 designs in all. There are now 25, using motifs which have constantly reappeared in my work. It says some more. It says, I did see your frames before I designed this line of moldings, which is my bread and butter. I was not especially conscious of them, probably because they are so right for your paintings. The paintings interested me infinitely more. However, if I had then and there, or thereafter, decided to produce a group of frame designs even remotely based on yours, I would have spoken of that angle to you. I am not a thief of ideas. I don't have to be. When I say I did see your frames before I designed my own, I must also say that I had likewise seen and admired countless old frames and sections of ornament which I considered to be the true point of departure from mine. Hurlbut and Carl Van Vechten and Bobby Locker, Dr. Genth and Ralph Flint, not to mention, to mention but a few, had all seen your frames before they saw mine. The great similarity seems to have escaped, to have escaped them too, for unless I am completely mistaken, 
each volunteered that they had not seen the like of mine before. So that, I think, is very interesting, the people that he's mentioning. William Hurlbut was a prolific 1920s playwright. Carl Van Becken, of course, we've heard about already. Bobby Locker was this Robert Locker. Dr. Arnold Gant, he was a German-born photographer. He, one of the things he's most known for, he was active in San Francisco, was photography of the immediate aftermath of the San Francisco earthquake and scenes of Chinatown in San Francisco. And Ralph Lind, who was a, a Siegel's protege and a critic for the art news. So he then goes on and he says, Yes, I do see, Florine, what you mean by your scalloped frame, which, as I now recall, is on the Statue of Liberty picture. No, it's not. But being like mine, or rather, mine like yours, the silhouette is not dissimilar, being the outline of shelf paper. But if I remember correctly, yours is a simple scallop like this, and mine is continuous like Spencerian ovals with an inside motif of narrow lines. And I, I had to look up Spencerian ovals. I was not familiar with the term. And there was a, a whole uh, style of handwriting that was referred to as Spencerian script, Spencerian handwriting. And even with all of this, he, he signs the letter, you know, lovingly Billy. And, uh, and he even says, you know, your, your charges are, are serious enough that I, I think I'm going to send a copy of this letter to, to some of our mutual friends. I mean, he was very concerned that she considered him uh, plagiarizing. Well, one of the other things he mentioned in the letter, which I was very grateful for, in his defense of himself, he mentions that he had contributed an article about architecture to Samuel Putnam's New Review, which was published in Paris in 1931. So I followed this, the New Review thread, and I ended up speaking to this lovely young librarian in, at the Southern Illinois University, which holds Samuel Putnam's papers. And he was able to find the issue of the new review of this article, An Architecture Revisited. And he was able to tell me that the author's name was William Justima. Now, William, or Billy Justima, could be a lecture in and of himself. He was a very interesting individual. He was living out in California. He was a companion to the photographer Margarita Mather. Um, there's uh, associations with them. She took pictures of him. There are photographs of Billy Justima by Carl Van Vechten from the 30s. This letter is from 38. Um, he published, he went on to establish an archive of textile design at the Cooper Hewitt Museum. He published two or three uh, books that are all about pattern and design, much like a modern day uh, grammar of ornament, much like Owen Jones's. But the other thing, he remarks in this letter about that he actually patented frames. And the Cavassier to which he referred was an art gallery in San Francisco that specialized at the time in the Disney animation cells. And that company has since been bought by a much larger concern. And I'm having a hard time finding a live person who will talk to me. I'm hoping that perhaps there are the Cavassier archives that might be able to shed some light on it. But what I did find, once again on the internet, is this patent, William Justima. William Justima. Um, as an assigner to Guthrie Cavassier of San Francisco, and it's this design building. And you can see how it is not the same as the scalloped design of Florines. It has a more undulant quality. I'm really excited to tell you that synchronicity and serendipity are present here because my friend and colleague, Eric Michael Tollefson, coming from an entirely different angle, has come to be aware of extensive patent drawings and molds of William Justima frame designs. And he's going to be writing about those, hopefully, in the not too distant future. So we'll learn a lot more about Justima and his role in frames and frame designs. But I do think it's safe to say, in fairness to Billy, he was not copying Florine's frames. And it does make you wonder, so where was Florine getting her ideas and what was her influence? In discussing her artwork, 
many people mention this book by Fito Best, Adolfo Best Mulgard, that was published in 1926, A Method for Creative Designs. And she actually did a portrait of Fito Best. But in his book, Best talks about these seven basic shapes and how anyone can teach themselves to be an artist by utilizing these seven basic shapes and then combining them in different ways. Well, we know that Florian and Fito Best were, were friends. They, they socialized together. So obviously, at, at minimum, they would have had conversations and chats, and she would have absolutely had his, Beth, had his book. Uh, she was a great fan of art books. But he devotes you know, entire pages to borders. And what but a border is a picture frame. And you can see that there are many different ways that you combine these different shapes and patterns. And sure enough, in Florine's papers at the Butler, there are many different sketches where you can see her exploring with this very thing and making its way eventually to this scallop shape. So we're talking about frames that date to the 30s, possibly 29, but then the early 30s. And in preparing, Lisa reminded me of this frame, which is a scallop frame. This is Ram's Head and Hollyhock, Georgia O'Keeffe, that belongs to the Brooklyn Museum. It's interesting, this frame we know was made by the frame maker George F. Of Jr. And this one is metal. That was actually a nod to vernacular um, tradition of Mexican tinware and tin work. But it makes me wonder, much like cellophane was in the ethers, if you will, in the 20s and 30s, that scallop, this motif of the scallop, was around and influencing more than one person. Bringing it up to the present day, this is a frame design that's offered by APF Munn that's referred to as their Stettheimer frame. And it's very interesting, not meant to malign APF in any way, but if you look at it, if anything, it's a lot more similar to Billy Jestima's frame design than it is to Florine's scallop frame. But it does speak to the, the way oftentimes a design or a form or a shape will be uh, uh, taken and interpreted and reinterpreted and can actually get a name that is not 100% accurate, where it might be more accurately referred to as inspired by. Well, there are remaining questions. Some of the questions that have been dogging me for the, at least the last year is who fabricated Florine's frames for her? Was it a framer? Was it a theater designer? Was it the furniture maker? And how did Florine decide which paintings would get special frames? You could say that some of her most masterful paintings, Asbury Park, for example, was a really important painting, and it ended up in this simple length molding. And yet then there were others, like this portrait for the family friend that got the first of the curly cube frames. Uh, Eddie, who donated many of these materials and Florine's diaries, um, notably redacted uh, a lot of them, as in cut out the pages. If, if she determined that this, materi this material was sensitive, she cut it out. And I have to point that out because to me, this was a really tantalizing page where she's, she's listing the month, and here she says shampoo. I'm certain these are expenses, that this was money that she was spending. This was her sort of accounting of where her money was going. And gee, if those pages were there, maybe had the name of a frame maker or a furniture maker that we might borrow from. But no such luck. Similarly, as I looked into frame makers, that's a rather daunting task. In the 1920 New York City directory, there were 163 framers listed. I've been looking at frames in detail for over 30 years, and I recognized maybe a little more than a dozen of the names of the frame makers. And how many of those frame makers have kept their records? Are they in Beinecke Library or somewhere that we can find them? So these are absolutely tantalizing questions that I do hope that one day I'll be able to answer in the future. 
Florine's multidimensional, immersive vision extended well beyond the canvas. Henry McBride eloquently stated, the picture that might rest on an easel spoke in a language that everything in the room confirmed. For Florine, her paintings were loved ones to be celebrated in opulent surroundings set like jewels in frames as innovative, whimsical, and highly original as the paintings they surround. Thank you.